welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. Special welcome to visitors who are with us today and those who are worshiping online as well. Please take note of a few announcements that are in your bulletins today. After worship, the prayer community will be meeting in the gathering room behind us. Also this evening at 5 o'clock, the Lenten prayer study continues with prayer in motion. Monday morning, the Stewardship and Finance Committee meets, and Tuesday evening session meets. Wednesday is our fourth Lenten concert and luncheon series, and the Boiling Springs High School Concert Choir will be here with us as our musical guests. You don't want to miss that. And there is only one more of the Lenten Concert Series left on March 29th when Dan Doherty from Derry Presbyterian Church will be here with us. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Let us worship God.
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you now, we share a deep need, for we are all lost without your grace. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our troubled thoughts. Forgive our wrongs. Give us true repentance. Transform us by your Spirit. Together we say, Amen. Amen. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. shall never be ashamed. 
His poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God. Whoops, Lord of the world. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs>
The second lesson today is from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, <clears throat> chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. This is the story of Elijah being threatened by Queen Jezebel and setting off into the wilderness where he then eventually meets God. The setup for this is that the Israelites have been uh, worshiping other gods, as they do so often, and that is partially because of Queen Jezebel, who has enticed her husband, King Ahab, and the other Israelites to worship these foreign gods, not to worship the Lord. And then Elijah sets up this contest between the prophets of Baal, who is worshipped by Jezebel and the Canaanites, and now the Israelites, um, sets up a contest which they fail and which God of Israel then proceeds to win. And this causes a great deal of problem uh, between Jezebel and Elijah, who then sets off into the wilderness. So listen to the word of the Lord here from 1 Kings chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, Jezebel's put a price on his head. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up, eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that from forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king over Aaron. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of 
Abel Maloa as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall kill, and whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation and our hope is in you all day long. As I was reading this text from 1 Kings, I couldn't help but think of those Snickers bar commercials, the ones that say, you're not you and you're hungry. You've probably seen those. Some of them have Betty White in them playing football. They're quite amusing. Elijah is hungry and mad when we find him here in 1 Kings 19. He is not himself. He's fleeing for his life. Back up a few chapters, and as I said before, we find the prophet Elijah in conflict, in conflict with the king of Israel, Ahab, and Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Scripture says that Ahab is a wicked king in large part because of his wife's influence on him. Jezebel worships Baal and Asherah, the Canaanite gods, and subsequently she convinces her husband and his people to abandon Yahweh, the God of Israel, and to worship Baal and Asherah. So they tear down the altars that have been built, and have been built to Yahweh, and they worship these Canaanite deities. And as punishment, God, the God of Israel, sends a drought upon the land. And Jezebel, she tries to use her royal power to eliminate the prophets of Israel, and she almost succeeds, except for a man named Obadiah, who is faithful to God and an official in King Ahab's court. And Obadiah manages to protect many of the survivors. He hides them in caves. And so Elijah comes along and proceeds then to make a mockery of Queen Jezebel and the supposed prophets of Baal. He gives them every chance in this contest that he sets up, he gives them every chance to call on Baal to send down fire from heaven and to burn up the sacrifice of a bull. And the prophets of Baal, they try valiantly, but in vain all day long. And the sacrifice is just laying there, gathering flies. It's not being burned at all. So now it's Elijah's turn, and he builds his own altar, an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, and digs a trench all the way around the altar. And then he cuts the bull into pieces, and he puts the pieces on the altar, and finally he has the whole thing drenched, soaked in 12 buckets of water before he calls on the Lord God of Israel who sends down fire to consume the whole thing, the bowl, the wood, the stones, the dust, even the water that has collected in the trench around the altar. And at the sight of this, the people of Israel fall on their faces and worship God once again. Then Elijah has the prophets of Baal seized and executed. And this really angers Queen Jezebel, because when she finds out what happened to the prophets of Baal, she sends a messenger to Elijah with the message that we heard this morning, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, look out, Elijah. Elijah knows that Jezebel is serious, and so he flees out into the wilderness. He goes to Beersheba first, and then he just keeps going. 
But after one day, just one day in the wilderness, he's pretty much had it. He's fearful and hungry and tired, and he's mad as all get out. And so Elijah sits down under a broom tree, and he asks God to take his life. Life isn't just, just isn't worth living anymore, he says. Take my life. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm no better than any of my ancestors. Elijah's a bit dramatic. Ever feel like Elijah? Exhausted? Defeated? Just plain mad? At anything and everything? Life rarely works out the way we planned it, does it? When faced with the wilderness, how does Elijah respond? He's ready to give up after one day. How do we respond to those arid places in our lives? How do we respond when life is hard, when life doesn't turn out the way we planned? Are you like Elijah, ready to give up? Or is there something more? Elijah has a fascinating career as a prophet. If you keep reading in the books of the kings, you'll see all that he does. He continually seeks to be faithful to the God of Israel, but all around him, the people of Israel are increasingly unfaithful to their God. Elijah's been called to be a prophet. It is a particularly difficult journey for him. There is great challenge in this work, and he often feels defeated, as if he is all alone. Like when he sits down under the broom tree and says, God, just end it all. But Elijah also knows that in order to do God's will, He's going to need something more than just his own strength, something more than just his own ability. That's the thing about following God's call in our lives, isn't it? Every call from God, whether it's big or small, is a journey that has challenge in it. Following God's call, being faithful to God's call in our lives, it requires more than what we ourselves can bring to it. We need the strength and the will and the faith that only God can give to us in order to finish the journey. God, you see, does not call those who are already equipped to serve. God equips, rather, those whom he calls to his service. So if you think you can't do something for God just because you don't have the gifts or the skills, if you're tired, if you're angry, if you're exhausted, just hang on. God isn't done with you yet. That day in the wilderness under the broom tree, Elijah's exhausted and he is afraid. He's hungry and thirsty and to be honest, he's had enough. He's had enough of dealing with rogue monarchs and impotent pagan prophets. He's tired of this call that God has placed in his life to be a prophet to people who are so unfaithful. It's like yelling into the wind every day. Several times Elijah says, look, God, I'm the only faithful one left. What kind of ego does it take to say that to God? I'm the only faithful one left in all of Israel. All those other people, they've all bowed down and worshipped another God. There in the wilderness, Elijah just wants it all to end. He doesn't see any way forward. And then we get to the beautiful part of this story, because suddenly an angel touches Elijah on the shoulder and tells him to get up. He's fallen asleep. And the angel says, wake up, get up, eat some bread and drink some water. And why don't you take another nap? And a while later, the second time, the angel comes to awaken Elijah again, saying to him, eat and drink in order to be strengthened and fortified, because you have a journey ahead of you. And for the next 40 days, Elijah lives on Mount Horeb in a cave. 
And after 40 days, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah there on the mountain. And after 40 days, Elijah is still refreshed, still fortified, still ready to hear God. And there on the mountain, Elijah meets God, not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in the sound of sheer silence. And in that moment, God gives Elijah his marching orders. Chin up, Elijah, your work is not yet finished. There are new kings to be anointed over Aram and Israel, and Elisha, Elisha, who will be your successor as prophet, well, he needs to be prepared and trained and anointed as well. And here's the real kicker, God says. You think you're the only one left. You think you're the only faithful one left in Israel, the only one who hasn't bent the knee to worship Baal. Well, actually, there are 7,000 men in Israel whose knees remain unbent. You are not alone. So here's your reminder, folks, that once upon a time, there was a prophet named Elijah, and he was mad, so mad about so many things that he said, God, I just want to die. And God said, eh, here's some food. Why don't you take a nap? So Elijah slept, and he ate, and eventually he decided things weren't so bad after all. All this is to say, you shouldn't as underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and a snap. <laughs> because we humans aren't designed to go, go, go 24-7. Yet that's increasingly how the world works these days, isn't it? We were built to work and to rest. And we need proper nourishment and we need communion with God in order to be our best selves. Failure to rest can absolutely interfere with our ability to hear God and to respond to God's call. There's nothing wrong with an honest day's work, but there is something wrong when we don't take a break, when we don't rest, when we can't find a Sabbath and a snack. I once heard a couple of pastors talking, and one of them said, I don't take a day off because the devil never takes a day off, and I have to fight the devil. And the other pastor said, I'm not sure, but I think you might want to look for another role model. <laughs> Jesus embodies this balance between work and rest in his earthly life. Food is central in the Gospels. Jesus and the disciples are frequently seen eating. And perhaps Jesus' best-known miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, is clearly important because it's the only miracle, apart from the resurrection, it's the only miracle that appears in all four of the Gospels. Not only do we see Jesus eating and feeding people, we also find Jesus resting, taking time by himself away from the crowds, away from the disciples. He even somehow manages to take a nap on a boat in the middle of a storm. In the Gospels, we also see Jesus taking time to pray, to commune with his Heavenly Father. Even on his last day, as the Roman guards are approaching and as he's sweating those great drops of blood, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Thy will be done. Jesus shows us that following God's call is a journey of great challenge. It requires more than we have to bring to it in terms of our own strength and our own ability. We need the strength and the will and the faith that only God can give to us. When Elijah was exhausted, when he had enough, when he was ready to die, God provided for him. When we're exhausted, when we've had enough, when we're ready to give up, Jesus bids us to remember. He's been there before. He's here with us now. So take a nap. Have a snack. 
trust in God's provision. Amen.
help us to remember that rest is not a bad thing. It is something you have given to us that we might be refreshed and restored. Lord, when we are doubtful, help us to trust. <coughs> Enable us to remember that you call men and women to your service. And though the journey is often difficult, you are there along the way. You offer your provision in the wilderness, on the side of the road, wherever we might be. And so in all these things, O oh Lord, remind us of your great love in Jesus Christ. Enable us to seek the ways of peace in this world and to live as your faithful disciples. We pray in Jesus' name, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have the opportunity to give back to God a portion of what God gives to us. The offering plates are at the doors. And exits for your use today invite you now to take this time to consider God's generosity and your response to it.
help the suffering honor all the people, love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you all.